People are lazy to think. That's why we have this fake pastors, fake prophecies. Is it because we, the new generation, we lack identity, we don't know who we are. And because of that, we are easily manipulated. I feel that somehow we also failed you. And it's, it's not even about education. It's about a sense of self. to another of my caring conversations which are aimed at promoting insight and agency for younger people especially in our very complex society with all the traumas we face environmentally, politically, socially, economically, spiritually. Ten months ago I was in Cape Town and had the pleasure of sitting on a bench at Kirstenbosch Gardens with Mpushin Tabeni after I just finished reading his book, A Broken River Tent, his first novel, historical novel, and we made a great connection, and, but we did say it would be nice to have a follow-up sometime in the future. And Push, more than a year has passed since your book was published. It's been met with great critical acclaim. Thank you, John. Um, good morning to your listeners again. It's wonderful to be here. We're in Joburg now, <laughs> the Golden City. Mm. It's actually, I, I, I like to call Joburg the city of my awakenings because I came here as a young 17 year old to study at Vitz and during those tumultuous time of uh, the 80s. Mm. But then now, here we are again. It feels so nostalgic and like a deja vu whenever I see places in Joburg. So much has changed. I, I want to read to you the description I put up on my YouTube film of our first interview, just so that people have a bit of an idea. When you own your own story, then you get to finish it, says Brené Brown, social worker and author. In Pushin Dabeni's first novel, The Broken River Tent, resonates loudly with that insight and his narration of the journey of Pila from order through disorder to reorder. And Push admits that his fictional character does represent an archetype of his own psycho-spiritual, cultural, historical integration. As such, his hero's journey, using Joseph Campbell's idea, of self-discovery through an imaginal encounter with the great Kasa King Makama is not only a historically accurate remembering but in a spiritually authentic remembering, hyphenated remembering, bringing together that which has been dis disconnected. Liberation theologian Gustavo Guterres would say, a reconnecting with these fragmented bits and pieces of historical memory into historical consciousness that in turn leads to revisioning and reclaiming. The hours I spent with him push in the Kirstenbosch Gardens reflecting on his journey and the commonality with my own journey. It was one of the highlights of my year, a year that had seen the beginning of the end of my own 18-year journey in support of the Amadiba coastal residents of the Wild Coast and getting a judge to endorse their right to say no to mining, lest their story repeated the tragic story of land dispossession and suffering that the Broken River Tent narrates. We talked about that too. So that's how I described my interpretation of it. Am I on the right track? <laughs> for me, for me, John, you've just blown my mind. This is so accurate. It's unbelievable. Mm. I couldn't have said it better myself. Mm. It's as if you got into my head and uh, saw what I, I was trying to say or trying to do. And by the way, if you are human, I was writing the book for you. Let's start off by saying, has the vision you had for the book materialized? What have been some of the surprises and maybe some of the disappointments? The reception it has had actually has surpassed my expectations, to be honest. Mm -hmm. uh, they was long listed for the Barry Ronja yeah, Sunday Times was, yeah. Literary Prize. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so it's it, it it means that at least uh, the the public out there mm. is paying attention. Uh, I see now in Africa there is a lot of interest. I read um, only yesterday, I think, uh, a quote. I can't remember from who, but it says that uh, the fictional, the African fictional writers are retelling our history. 
which is quite uh, nice in a in a way to say. Even now, when I came here, I came for the discussion for some wonderful, intelligent book club that is called Between the Covers. Mm. My Lord, I, so <laughs> those ladies are, in, I, are really, really, really feisty, intelligent. Mm. And they, sometimes they put me on a corner. Mm. Uh, they About picked a lot of uh, tenancies, patriarchal tenancies in, in Chief Magoma, which naturally is true because mm. the, Af- the, the, the Kosa tradition was quite yeah, patriarchal. Yeah. Yeah. And then in my discussions, most of the time when I go to discuss the book, I mm. found that my readers understood very well what I was trying to do. Mm. I, I think it excites them that I decided not just to retell history, but to resurrect it. Mm. Yeah. I like it when one, one lady said to me, it felt like I was talking to my great grandfather. Really? You understand? And I said, but <laughs> that's exactly what I wanted. <laughs> so in a way, uh, there are more positives than, uh, and uh, even the, the critical aspects, I, I accept it. Uh, like for instance, okay. uh, especially people who are used to light reading mm. tend to think that it's very dense. Mm. And uh, of course it's, it's a little bit dense because it's history. Mm. And also it's a kind of a reinterpretation of history. The, the, in my narratives, as you know, in the book, I, I use a lot of geography. I use a lot of perhaps a little bit of philosophy. Hey, this is this is Pillar's journey of healing. Mm. And I said, and then um, the humiliation that our nation went through, mm. and then he feels it in his blood mm. because he's supposed to be a successful professional, and he does not really understand what is wrong. Mm. You understand? And then he can see that by somewhere along the the line, he has actually either lost. Mm. Or his identity, and he does he can't dis- he can't find it. And there's a, a strange phenomenon. I mean, I'm I'm not gonna uh, pretend when you are educated, you are not mm. educated. Mm. But then you are educated into what? Mm. This is the point of Pillar, because he 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 was educated in science. He got a career. Mm. When he was overseas, he was amazed at how other people knew their histories, mm. and he didn't. Mm. And then he he felt that by this is what why he doesn't have an identity. Mm, so yeah. this is what makes him uh, unsettled in the in the world. We, we have a phenomena which we call ukutwasa. Mm. So I was using that ukutwasa when a, a person is, is is being invaded by the ancestors mm. and they want to use him. Mm. So in in my sense, I wanted to make him a, a medium mm. of Makoma as a spirit. But then because he's an educated person, he does not understand that phenomenon. Mm. So he, he thinks it's a sickness. He's confused. Mm. He thinks he is running out of, he's, he's running mad. You understand that? Yeah. And so they, they, they go around the, 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 these places with Makoma and uh, gradually he accepts that he is part of yeah. Makoma. He is part of these people. And yeah. then the Kosas and all that stuff were his people. One well, of my previous visits to Cape Town after interviewing you, I sat... Wilhelm for wood. Yeah, so my name is Wilhelm for wood, and in South Africa, even today, the surname for wood is associated with Dr. H. F. for So for many black South Africans, he would personify the evil of that system. And I have to find a way to deal with that, not to run away from it, not to deny it, but to find a way to address it in a constructive way. Beginning of my book, I've got a quote from Ben Okri. Stories are the secret reservoir of values. Change the stories that individuals and nations live by and tell themselves, and you can change the individuals and nations. If they tell themselves stories that are lies, they will suffer the future consequences of those lies. If they tell themselves stories that face their own truth, they will free their histories for future flowering. But you are uniquely someone who has journeyed an excruciatingly painful path to face your own truth, both at an individual, personal level, and as someone who is a direct descendant of the person who has come to embody perhaps more than anyone else a false narrative, a false story, mm. as you would see it, because I would see it, of nationhood. Mm. Hendrik van Verwood. Thank you, John, and thank you for this invitation mm. to reflect deeply about what this kind of journeying is about. 
And I do resonate with that quote. I mean, I've done a lot of work in the last couple of decades around storytelling and the, the challenge of finding stories that are humanizing instead of dehumanizing. Mm. Uh, I also have learned in retrospect and with, with a lot of uh, introspection that the challenge sometimes is that what, what we refer to as lies in retrospect can be very convincing in the present moment. And one of my next ambitions for these caring conversations is sit you down together with Will Allen and just let the two of you have a conversation because I found a chilling sense of familiarity hearing Wilhelm tell his story from what you had shared and, and what you had written about in your book. Mm. So hopefully this, this is what this video series can help do is be catalysts for deeper conversations. Yeah. No, it, 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 it sounds like a fantastic idea. Mm. I would honestly would like to uh, sit down with him and then talk to him. Uh, in particular, the Afrikaners and the Kosas are very alike. Mm. Uh, they are nationalists, of course, and they're mm. deep nationalists. It's unfortunate that uh, the others, the Afrikaners, uh, chose to acknowledge they, they, because they, they wanted supremacy. Mm. They, 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 want, they, they chose to follow the racial tendencies. And, and, and for, for that matter, if you remember in my book, uh, my comma was quite fond was quite fond of Conrad de Beers, mm. and to me de Beers is uh, is one of the founders of the African mm. nation. Mm. He he was even married to mm. uh, Carl's mom, mm. and and then he uh, my comma was quite fond of him. He learned a lot about the the white people's uh, thinking and uh, Western civilization through him. Mm. As, as a closer person, the, 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 the concept of assimilating with other people is not new to us. Mm. And even my comma, I have, I have him say that, but we've always assimilated with other people. We've, we've assimilated mm. it with the Khoisan people, with every people. The only thing we couldn't understand with the white people is that but they refuse any assimilation whereby they don't become the supreme person. They always want to rule, to reign mm. over other people. You understand, and they think they are better than other people, and then that thing was confusing to the to the black people. Mm. This kind of exclusive nationalism, exactly. you understand, so that it involves everybody. And find the more universal. And my writing, my book too, was in some ways uh, also trying to have to grapple with this famous mm. quote by Ben Oakley. For me, I was saying, well, hang on, it's easy for me to sit and kind of point fingers and and or be patronising about classes and the Afrikaners, what about my own history? Because I was brought up very much with the assumption that the British civilization was just superior mm -hmm. to everything else. Mm -hmm. And as I've now looked into what happened in the 19th century with Cecil John Rhodes and, and the, when he was Cape Prime, Prime Minister, my son came home from school one day when he was a teenager and he said, you know, he was given a question at school, is there one thing you could change? In, uh, as a historical outcome, what was it? And they had to write an essay on it. And he said he decided that the one thing he would like to see changed was the outcome of the Anglo-Boer War. He felt that the Afrikaners had been dealt with atrociously by the British. And I said, well, don't let your grandmother hear you say that, because her father came out to fight in the Anglo-Boer War, and she had grown up with this belief that there was be the kind of the, sort of the frontiers of redemption for, for a world. Now we have a very different narrative that we're coming to terms with now. None of us kind of escapes you know, scot-free when that probing searchlight of historical consciousness starts focusing on us. It'd be, it'd be great to see how, uh, where we stand now as uh, mm. generations after this, when mm. our forefathers uh, were at war and at loggerheads with mm. each other, and how we find now as a new generation, how we can find ways of healing and mm. ourselves and ways of reconciling, reconciling mm. ourselves. I mean, true reconciliation. I don't talk about what is happening now. If you think you're going to reconcile without justice, mm. that's mm. nonsense. Mm. I'm sure. talking about fundamental true reconciliation. That, but a damage, we, are, we all acknowledge that a real damage has been mm. done here. Now, that's mm. another thing we, we refuse to, to acknowledge that Mm. Like, you know, in Germany, mm. until the Germans uh, admitted that, but yes, there's a psychological damage that has been done mm. into the nation here. And mm. then the government opened up uh, counseling centers for everybody mm. for free to go. You see how violent a nation mm. we are. Mm. It's because we haven't uh, acknowledged to ourselves mm. the trauma 
that mm. was apartheid and the, and the colonial mm. system. Mm. Until we do that, then, that's a, then we will find a, a, a true path, an authentic mm. path towards reconciliation. Mm. So I think it's, uh, it's uh, incumbent upon us as a new generation to find those ways to, in humility actually, in, mm. in both sides about ourselves mm. and say, but okay, real damage has been done here. Uh, luckily, the Africaners know that experience, mm. and they rose from the dust after mm. the Anglo Boer War, and mm. they, when they got into government, were able to support each other into one of the greatest uh, nations mm. in, in the world. Actually, mm. as you as you can see, I mean, mm. the, the the South African uh, economy itself is dependent basically on African mm. uh, okay. landlords' entrepreneurship. You know, sure. so yeah. we need to find ways of mm. uh, expanding that circle. Mm. And then for them to acknowledging that, but the black South Africans also are part of, uh, of, of South Africans mm. like the Africaners, you understand? We need mm. to, to diminish this, this, uh, mm. this kind of exclusive nationalism, exactly. you understand? So that it involves everybody. But I wanted to say, you know, you said you donated about 80% of yourself to the character in your book, Pila. And I can see that. Um, and, but having got to know you, as a friend in some ways, but how has writing the book helped you understand more about that mystery area about yourself, that 20% that you even thought you know? I think of Jahari's window, you know, you talk about that unknown mystery area. Yeah. Look, there's, there's no question about it. Um, actually, I think all fictional writers uh, do put a little bit of their lives into their fictional characters. I, I would admit that. Because sometimes you turn even get to a situation whereby you believe your own life. I'm Peter Clark, who said apartheid was darkness masquerading as light. Mm. And I've, I've held on to that because I think my grandfather, in the, in the early days of my childhood, my socialization as a teenager, even into a sense of Afrikaner mm. nationalist cultural identity, he was revered. Mm. And in fact, today he is still revered in conservative. Mm. Africana nationalist mm. circles. And so there's a, almost like a halo mm. <laughs> you know, around him because of the way he gave his life when he was assassinated mm. in, in 1966 for this cause of Africana mm. nationalism in competition and conflict with English mm. uh, colonialism. Mm. So there's definitely this, this aura of, of almost sanctification around him. Mm. And, and I have had to be exposed to the pain of black South Africans mm. on the receiving end of his policy of so-called mm. separate development mm. uh, to become aware of what that uh, reality really was and, and to expose the lie. Mm. Um, and I think because of this personal connection with, mm. with him as the prime minister at that time, when people spoke about their anger and their bitterness mm. about apartheid, they often would refer to him. Mm. And then it becomes very personal because he's not just a politician, he's also my mm. grandfather. He fed you on his lap with the yeah. with milk when you were a kid. Yeah, well, I mean, it's in, in my, in my uh, research for the latest mm. book, I actually looked with new eyes at a very familiar family picture. Mm. And I just happened to be this little baby on his mm. lap. Mm. And what struck me when I looked at it more closely was that he was literally holding a bottle of milk. Mm. Now, my mom tells me that what actually happened was that I started to cry <laughs> when they were trying to, you know, take this picture. And she was standing there with a milk bottle and he ended up taking the milk bottle. And he looked actually quite relaxed with really? it. And so in my reflection on him, mm. uh, in my latest, mm. you know, turning of the spiral, as it were, mm. I've actually looked at this as a very unusual, almost maternal image. Mm. Uh, but what it does open up is the whole question around what did I imbibe with not just my mother's mm. milk, but mm. with my grandfather's milk. Mm. And it has challenged me not to distance myself from him too easily. Mm. You know, there's more of him in me. Mm. There's more of him in my bones, as it were, not just in my blood. Um, mm. And that's why I need to look at him, mm. and when I expose the lie, and I look for the life, then I need to also be quite humble about how I do that. Mm. I, I have to say that in the process of doing that kind of mm. questioning, 
and and probing and and uh, mm. grappling with what the truth really is. I was deeply influenced by by a lot of of, of engagements with Black South Africans, mm. going back to the 80s, mm. during the 90s, and now increasingly also with with mm. people that I share our village mm. with and friends, mm. and they often are the kind of midwives of the truth. But, uh, uh, the, the, the truth of the matter is, in the character of Pila, I myself was trying to unlearn a lot of garbage, mm. psychological garbage I grew up with myself that became part of my character. I, I, I laugh sometimes when people think uh, fiction is entertainment. I don't think fiction is entertainment. If, if anything, is fiction is a process of, of mm. raising self-consciousness. Uh, I, I learned a lot from the book. It was like putting myself also on the pedestal. Mm. I was uh, under a lot of uh, psychological strain and I would admit perhaps even a little bit depressed. Mm. So I, I, I wanted to create a character who I saw in myself who was mm. a little bit world weary. He, he had all this career success but mm. then the meaning of it was eluding him. Mm. You understand? Because he had no identity, proper mm. identity. Okay, creating the character of, of Pila for me was also a, a process of a catharsis. Even though I found the, 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 the history, our history, mm. traumatic, I mm. asked myself, how can you use it as a healing mm. uh, mechanism? Mm. You understand? And how can you use it as a way of defying uh, all the odds mm. towards what you, you, you need to go as a nation? It's a reason why I told, if you, you remember, I told myself, I can't uh, end the book with my coma just dying at the mm. Robin Island. Mm. I needed something evocative, something mm. uh, that will lift up mm. our spirit, especially mm. as black people, which is why I created that scene of a, mm. of, of, of a trial in mm. Cape Town, mm. whereby my coma was, ex was defiant. Mm. Because for me, and that spirit of my coma is the spirit that you, you, you would identify mm. also in Steve Biko. I wanted to, to end the book in a triumphant spirit rather mm. than in a, a tragic uh, mm. way that he, he, he ended up because it was tragic mm. how he ended up. It might be yeah. even good for you to read that passage mm. when you talk about mm. going to Orania. Yeah, we're talking about really a, a quite a, an important moment in my own journey where I was able to go to that house in Urania with a close colleague, a Professor Pumla Gubordo Marigizela, mm. and she wrote that amazing book on yes. Eugene de Kock, A Human Being Died That Night. And she was interested to come with me to Urania because mm. she was interested to understand really what was going on there. And so when we visited Urania, we ended up going through this house where there's a lot of things on display. Um, and so I'm walking with her through this. I mean, she understands political history, political trauma. Uh, and some of those uh, memories that she had of him, of course, would have been very different, you know, memories of dancing in the street on the day mm -hmm. that he was assassinated. And then we find ourselves in front of a display cupboard with the clothes my grandfather had been wearing on the day of his murder. Mm -hmm. Besides the old-fashioned formal work outfit, there are familiar pictures of him as Prime Minister. There are a few walking sticks in the left corner, and at the bottom, his watch, his wallet, a few writing utensils, and a copy of the official program of his state funeral. His shoes are placed next to his neatly folded trousers. The jacket is marked with four red flags where the knife struck. The white shirt doesn't need any pointers. The blood stains are diluted, but clearly visible. In the right corner is a line from a speech he gave on the day of the covenant in 1958, the year he took up the highest political office. We are not fighting for money or possessions, we are fighting for the life of a nation. Mm. I think what happened with this recent visit to Orania and with this writing of this book and going into the diaries of my grandmother, speaking to my own mother, hearing that story about the washing of the clothes, mm. I think I was confronted more with almost my, what is my connection with this mm. family, you know, and even emotionally, how do I really connect with mm. this? Yeah. So it was almost like a, a turn of the of mm. the, the wheel, where it's almost coming back to where I no, started, yeah. but with a, with a different mm. with a uh, set of eyes. And I have in mind, you know, Joseph Conrad's The Hero's Journey, you know, mm. where we start from a familiar place. Mm. In that process of disorder, when we have to let go of the mm. familiar, we've got to leave even our mentors behind, 
you have to go into that dark mm. cave. For me, the, the cave experience or this kind of disorientating, disorienting uh, experience really happened in the mid 80s when mm. I was studying in Holland. Mm. But I was confronted during that time with the life experiences of, of fellow students and books. I mean, I remember the book by uh, Donald Woods about mm. Steve Biko. And a number of things in the media started to make me aware that the, the truth that I grew up with was really, you know, a lie. Uh, and mm. the truth that I grew up to believe in was really a lie. Mm. So, so that was the, the initial disillusionment um, of mm. the, the, the wheel, where it's almost coming back to where I started, no, yeah. but with a, with a different mm. with a uh, new, set of eyes. With, an excel, with a new tonic, you know, the toxic somehow transformed to a tonic. With an inspiration, yeah. something, yeah. something healing. Yeah. Yeah. That, cool. yeah. It is so obvious. It, it, it goes back to what, where we, you, you started with the fervor that you would like me to sit with him. Our histories are the same, are common, because our ancestors fought each other, or loved each other, or hated each other. Whether we like it or not, we have the same common history. What is imperative now is how we reconcile them and how we create a new path that will, that will lead us into prosperity instead of the po conflict of the past. Mm -hmm. I am very, very, very strong towards that because this uh, mutual hatred is not going to get us anywhere. What it has done in the past was to destroy this beautiful land. We cannot substitute white racism and hatred with black nationalism and hatred. It's not going to get us anywhere. You understand it? So we need to calm ourselves down. Uh, and I, I want to emphasize this strain, this strain uh, now. <laughs> but like, for instance, you know me, uh, what St. Irenaeus said that uh, the glory of God is a human being fully alive. Mm. We need to, to, to find the, uh, the ways, because we're all human, especially common, common, common values, and take us to where we would like to see this country uh, moving towards. Otherwise, as they say, we will all perish together as fools.